be honest, I also felt a little bit sorry for Marcel Breuer's Whitney building. It's an icon with its own odd kind of beauty, but I always felt as though it never got its fair share of love. I grew up in the 60s and 70s in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which was a place where, at least until I went off for college, a certain kind of late modernism, wood frame houses and brick buildings of Harvard Square seemed to get along quite well with each other. So when I moved to New York in the mid-1980s, I wasn't prepared for the ferocity of the ideological battles that were taking place here and that had divided architecture. The Whitney seemed to be at the middle of it. It was an aggressive building. It had this concrete moat that separated it from the city. It wasn't unusual in those days to run into someone who would still get enraged by the building. It was some, even to calmer heads, a building that um, seemed to imply something uncomfortable. It was somehow linked with all the failures of the modernist era, and to a certain degree, everything that had gone wrong with New York in the 60s and 70s. Since those days, I've met more and more people who seem to be fond of the building. At the same time, I've also wanted to sort out what it is that caused this kind of sense of um, why we had to reduce it to a certain kind of category and simplify it, think of it in terms of formulas. When we think of high modernism, we think of people like Le Corbusier, of the Bauhaus, we think of the Soviet constructivists, people who are outsiders, who would try to overthrow the center. Breuer was a different kind of modernist. He was trained at the Bauhaus, he was younger, a generation younger than Gropius or Mies, and he was designing steel tubular chairs, while those two were designing some of the major icons of the 20th century. He made his name in the United States after he'd fled Europe, at a time when America was emerging as a major superpower. And he bought into this notion that American industry could be retooled in some sense, to be retooled to create the foundations of a new society. It's hard to imagine today the hold that narrative had on the American imagination. Even before the war was over, Mies van der Rohe was fantasizing about turning bomber factories like this into concert halls. Bucky Fuller was trying to get the airplane industry to retool its factories for the production of mass housing. And by the 1950s, modern architecture was part of the mainstream. It had reached into every corner of post-war society. It had reached into the bedrooms of the average American nuclear family. There are lots of theories about what went wrong with this modernist experiment. A lot of the problems were obviously self-inflicted. Um, the intoxication that the modernists had with mass production standardization, the idea that people could be arranged like an assembly line, but part of the story had to do with the way in which the movement's ideals were distorted by the politics of the, coast of the Cold War. The pressures that were brought to bear on it, which were very different than the pressures that were brought to bear on art. This goes back to the beginning of the Culture War, when the Soviets embraced so, uh, socialist realism, a kind of overbloated classicism, as a way to show their cultural superiority. Here it would be different. It was aimed at the middle class, not at the proletariat. It was meant to be progressive, and it was somehow meant to be liberated from the weight of Europe's cultural baggage. The State Department was one of the first political institutions to latch on to this idea. And by the late 40s, right after the war, they were building co modernist consulates and embassies all over Europe and the Middle East. This is Saarinen's embassy in London in a kind of imperial modern style. Sert's embassy in Baghdad, in a kind of Middle Eastern modern style. And this is Breuer's brutalist modernist building at The Hague. Nixon was plugging this new society's kitchen debates with Khrushchev. Here he's standing in front of a golden geodesic dome by Bucky Fuller. And so did Conrad Hilton in a hotel such as this one in Istanbul. My dream, Hilton wrote, was to show countries most exposed to communism, the other side of the coin, the fruits of the free world. And there they are. Back in New York, corporate leaders at Lever Brothers, Seagram's, PepsiCo, were turning the Park Avenue corridor into emblems of corporate enlightenment. And of course, the Museum of Modern Art was pushing a similar narrative in its galleries.
This is Breuer's model house in the sculpture garden in 1949. It wasn't long before people started to notice a gap between that narrative and Cold War reality. If modernism looked glamorous on Park Avenue, it was failing in its larger social mission, especially in the area of urban planning. The Dickensian squalor that modernism was supposed to clean up was turning into a war against cities in general, part of a much broader shift that was taking place in Eisenhower-era America at the time. When we think of the slum clearance projects, the boom of car culture, the suburbs, the abandonment of the inner city. Meanwhile, activists like Jane Jacobs on the left here were making people aware of the arrogance of the men who led the modernist charge. And there was a growing sense of betrayal, I think, among many people, the sense that the modern movement had somehow failed them and let them down, which I think has a lot to do with the fury of the reaction against it. Breuer was hired by the Whitney in the midst of all of this, just as Penn Station was being demolished, and just as Jane Jacobs and Robert Moses were squaring off in some of their most heated battles. It's a small wonder, wonder then, that the Whitney became the uh, favorite target of cartoonists. Here's one of them from the time it opened. And here's another one. <laughs> Critics called it a clenched fist, a black crusader castle, a monster. It sometimes seemed as though the building had grown up to be twice its actual size. Even Ada Louise Huxtable, who was one of the most level-headed critics of the time and someone who really was pretty free of ideological baggage, seemed to struggle to find a way to talk about the Whitney. After acknowledging the Breuer's artistry, especially in the design of the galleries, she went on to describe the building as somber and severe, one that reflected the current mode of architecture for sculpture's sake, something we heard a lot of lately. It may be a kind of miniature Alcatraz on Madison Avenue, she wrote. <laughs> but it will not be cheap, thin, tinny, shoddy, or routine. And that's more than can be said of most of the city's current construction. And this was in 1966. Breuer was his own worst enemy, in a way. He um, dismissed the surrounding brownstones as worthless, saying that, I didn't try to fit the building into the neighborhood because the neighboring buildings aren't any good. Then, in 1966, he accepted a commission to design a 55-story tower on the top of Grand Central Terminal, which you can see at the bottom of it there. Um, probably not his best idea. <laughs> the tower caused an outcry, needless to say. Jackie O, Brendan Gill, and Philip Johnson locked arms in front of the terminal to protest it. And the newly formed Landmarks Commission took the battle all the way to the Supreme Court, where it won which is one of the first major victories of the preservation movement anywhere in the United States. By then, the profession was moving in other directions. There were still people who were pushing the modernist agenda. There were still some diehards out there. People like Kevin Roach, uh, this is one UN Plaza, who were building massive geometric um, mirrored glass hotels and office complexes. You have the cylindrical towers of John Portman with their soaring atriums, and they seem to take their cues from a kind of late modernism, the Apollo space program, and early disco. <laughs> I'm not sure if these were statements about confidence or if they had just something to do with our state of denial at the time. But in any case, the major trend was to look for answers in the past, to look for answers in a pre-modernist past. The most serious people who were doing this were Robert Venturi and Denise Scott Brown, who were looking to things like Italian mannerism. Then they were followed by people like Michael Graves and the new urbanists, who kind of had a much less nuanced idea of um, what classicism should be, or traditionalism in that case. But if you were around in those days, it sometimes seemed like somebody was jumping off the modernist bandwagon almost every day. Ben Thompson, who designed the design research building I showed you earlier that I grew up next to, was suddenly creating places like this, the Faneuil Hall Marketplace. And then you had Philip Johnson, who's shown here in the late 70s, clutching on the cover of Time magazine, clutching a model of his AT&T tower um, with its Chippendale top. And this was the man who introduced modernism in the 1930s to the United States. The problem, I think, is that what had begun as a thoughtful critique of modernism's failings had started to assume an uglier, more edible quality. 
And that hostility made it harder for people to see the difference between a good modernism building and a bad modernist building. When the Whitney announced, for example, that it planned to build a huge addition, this one by Michael Graves, you got the feeling that his postmodern allies took up his cause with a bit too much glee. Michael Sorkin, who I really enjoyed reading then, referred to it as a petulant, edible piece of work, an attack on a modernist father by an upstart, intolerant child, blind or callow, perhaps, but murderous. <laughs> what killed the proposal and saved the Whitney, ironically, was not the validity of Sorkin's arguments, but the newly empowered Landmarks Commission, which refused to let the museum tear down a couple of brownstones next door. Years later, when I saw Rem Koolhaas's proposal for a Whitney expansion, I read it as a mischievous commentary on the controversy that had followed the building ever since its birth. And there's Rem Koolhaas's proposal there. It seemed to be an expression of the contortions the architect had to go through to avoid offending anybody. <laughs> If we think of the Whitney differently today, in fact, it's not because buildings change, it's because the city has. It's become safer, cleaner, more generic. And where we once worried about the spiral of urban decay, today should be worried about how uniform our historic urban centers have become, both in terms of the character of the architecture and the people who live here. Perhaps not surprisingly, I now meet a lot of young people, I'm mostly talking about architects, artists, students, who no longer see modernism as the great evil that it once was. Some of the most thoughtful and articulate preservationists I meet, for example, have made late modernism their new cause, including works like Breuer's 1968 Pirelli building, which was partly torn down uh, to make way for an IKEA parking lot not that long ago. And I've also been pleasantly surprised by the number of artists, people like Wade Guyton, who started to tap into architecture and design of the 60s and 70s for inspiration in their own work. Many of these people, I think, feel a longing for what the buildings from this period seem to represent, a sense of common purpose, of cohesion, that was the upside of Cold War America. It's the reason, I think, that we feel a certain nostalgia for the World Trade Center towers, this kind of stubborn confidence that they convey, which we've somehow lost. So I'd like to close with a sort of plea, really, for a more tolerant, open, and inclusive view of the historical city, one where different styles, different points of view are celebrated rather than repressed. My ideal, I guess, is a city like Rome or Damascus in their heyday, where you could see Roman, Christian, Ottoman, modern architecture rubbing up against each other, a place where, in New York's case, brutalism and modernism could coexist. It's the idea of the city as a visual record of the conflicts that, cr that created it, rather than a city where those conflicts get swept under the rug. Then I think we should forget some of the cliches we've learned about late modernist architecture and try to step back um, and look at it with fresh eyes. Maybe go back to the way we looked at architecture when we were children, before we were actually told what we were supposed to think about it. I think then, the Whitney becomes something less threatening. You start to read it differently. You start to see richness in the contrast between the Breuer building and the little townhouses next door. You can pick up on things, like the sudden transition from the monumentality of the facade to the more domestic, intimate feeling of the lobby. And you might notice that the way the granite facade steps back, which seems so arbitrary at first, is a reflection of the organization of the galleries inside, which become larger and more airy as you climb from floor to floor. And you see an architect who's simply trying to struggle to make sense of the times that he lives in. Thank you.